saying this so everyone watching online can see this as well, because this will go on our YouTube video too. Who I am in this pulpit, I'm the same annoying person at home. My wife will tell you that, okay? What you see is what you get. I, I try very hard not to be some kind of two-faced monster or anything like that. What I say, what I preach here, my family hears throughout the week, all right? So when I say I'm Pentecostal, I'm Pentecostal. If you don't want biblical Pentecostalism, you don't want real Pentecostalism. But we are an Assemblies of God Pentecostal church. And if during the worship time, you believe the Lord has given you a message in tongues to deliver to the church congregation, whether you have an interpretation or not, do so. Because then someone else may receive the interpretation. Now, if you have a word of knowledge, which is basically a prophecy, and you want to speak that during that time, I hope you feel free to do that. Here's the catch. What is said has to align with God's word. And if you're going to say it out loud, and it's not biblical, I'm going to correct you out loud. If it's from God, you don't have anything to worry about. If it's from your flesh or something like that, then you have something to worry about. Amen? Now, with all of that said, we're going to begin reading in verse 20. I hope I've made that very clear. If you have a word of knowledge or something like that, if you feel like the Lord is inspiring you or, or, or prompting you to do that next week or even this week at some point, uh, not during the sermon because that's when it becomes chaos and 1 Corinthians 14 tells us God is a God of order and these things must be taken place in order. Now, if you have a word, I should say this before I move on. If you do have a message in tongues and there is no interpretation, hey, don't worry about that because we're gonna disregard it. We're just gonna act like nothing happened. That's what Paul tells us to do. There should be an interpretation. But you don't have, part of when you read 1 Corinthians, what Paul is doing is correcting and teaching Christians who didn't know, who didn't understand. And sometimes there's a time and a place for that. And if you have a message in tongues, you think it's from God, maybe you should have kept it to yourself, like 1 Corinthians 14 tells us. Or you should have, explained, or you should have delivered it. Maybe the person who had the interpretation needed to be obedient. But without that interpretation, we're just going to brush it aside and we're going to keep moving, okay? I hope I've made that very clear. We are a Pentecostal church. If anybody comes along and tells you that, you know, pastor doesn't like that, you have my permission, no, you have my blessing to go liar, okay? Because they're spreading a lie. It's not true if that's what they're saying. So we're not... Where the topic, the, the title for the message today is A House Divided. And when people do that, by the way, again, I am who I am. If I had a problem with you giving a message in tongues, I'd come and talk to you. If, you, if someone says, pastor said this or pastor did this, but you didn't hear it from me, I didn't. It's as good as, as if I didn't, okay? So that's, that's addressed. We're going to move on into the message because I want to get into this. I'm going to preach for two hours today because Dale Johnson challenged me. <laughs> maybe half that, maybe half that. Beginning in verse 20, the Bible reads, Jesus entered a house and the crowd gathered again so that they were not even able to eat. When his family heard this, they set out to restrain him because they said he's out of his mind. The scribes who had come down from Jerusalem said he is possessed by Beelzebul and he drives out demons by the ruler of demons. So he summoned them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand but is finished. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for all sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. His mother and brothers came and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him and told him, look, your mother 
Your brothers and your sisters are outside asking for you. He replied to them, who are my mother and my brothers? Looking at those sitting in a circle around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Again, today's title for the message is A House Divided. And if you're taking notes and you want to write this down, the parallel passages you'll find in the other two synoptic gospels, Matthew and Luke, they're found in Matthew 12, 22 through 50, Luke 8, 19 through 21. But I should warn you, they do kind of skip around a little bit. And here's what the whole purpose of this series has been. The idea is that we get a better grasp of who Jesus is. And the people mentioned in this text today didn't get it. They missed who Jesus was. They misunderstood him, right? Some people believe Jesus is a great moral teacher, and we'll dive into that a little bit more. But to to misunderstand Christ, and again, if you're taking notes, to misunderstand Christ is to miss everything that matters. If you don't have a good grasp of who the biblical Christ is, you're going to miss out on a lot. But if you miss entirely who Jesus is, you're going to miss out on everything. Now, some some people, when they preach this text, they will preach uh, on C.S. Lewis's trilemma. Um, How many of you, show of hands real quick, have ever heard that word before? Two? Awesome. Maybe three? Okay. Oh, she's scratching her head. So, two. Okay. Not a real popular name or popular word in Christianity, But C.S. Lewis came up with this uh, teaching, and it's very good. I'm not bashing people who preach this way. I'm just not going that route for today's message. I have in the past, and maybe you will again someday. But the trilemma of C.S. Lewis is that he proposes Jesus Christ was one of three people, one of three things. He was either a liar, he was a lunatic, or he was, in fact, Lord. Now, if he's a liar, we have to think about this. We just talked about this last week. The disciples were willing to be tortured and die for everything Jesus said and did. If he's a liar, are they really willing to go through that? Probably not. So he's not really a liar. Also, if you're attending our Wednesday night classes, uh, this Wednesday night we're talking quite a bit about the reliability of who Jesus was. We're going to go a little more into this. And this topic, so if that's something that's interesting to you, um, feel free to join us Wednesday at 7. The other idea is that he's a lunatic. Now, how many of you know someone legitimately crazy? I'll raise two hands because I know a few. I, you just meet my family. <laughs> I'm going to stop. Okay. You know somebody crazy, and they tell you some pretty crazy stuff, Right? We had this guy in my hometown. His name was Robert. I'm not going to say any more about his information, but his name was Robert. Robert believed that he and my friend John were, were the literal two prophets mentioned in the book of Revelation. Pretty wrong if you've ever read Revelation. That's crazy talk, okay? I am not going to go around the world and tell people Robert's one of the two people, you know, one of the two prophets that God mentions in Revelation, who was going to die and be resurrected, because Robert's crazy, right? So the same thing happens. Jesus probably wasn't a liar, because people were willing to die for what he said. They believed the truth that he spoke. He's probably not a lunatic, because nobody's going to die for the words of a crazy man. So what option does that leave? That he is, in fact, Lord. Lewis goes on to say, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He'd either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, Or he would be the devil of hell himself. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come away with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. 
He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So that's the trilemma, and I only bring that up because it is an important topic, and it is something that I am going to touch briefly on throughout the sermon, but that's not the, the outline of the sermon. Instead, what we have, what we see in our text, and as we've been going through the text of Matthew, what we see now is Matthew using a specific literary device that I don't know the exact literary word for it, but uh, Chuck Swindoll had a great phrase. He called it a story sandwich. Because what he does is he starts with one thing, and then he gives us some meat, a bigger story, and then he wraps it up. So it's like a piece of bread, your bologna. Well, we don't want to use bologna because that's not, okay, you know what I mean. Your ham, right? And then, and then your last slice of bread. And so the way I've divided up the sermon today is in three parts, as if it's three chapters to this story. And we begin with the first part, siblings and scribes. So we look at the siblings of Jesus and the scribes who are all coming down to see him. We see in verse 20, Jesus entered a house and the crowd gathered again so that they were not even able to eat. The NASB and the, and the Greek and the ESV tend to lean a little more towards the wording, Jesus came home. Whose home is this? Is it his house? More than likely, as we've seen throughout scripture so far, it's probably Peter's house. He's, that's where Jesus seems to be staying, right? All the way back in chapter 1 and chapter 2, we saw this. And this crowd is probably the same crowd that's been following him along all this time, but has gained new people. More people are being drawn to Jesus. And so the idea is Jesus is now coming home, in a sense, to relax. He's coming home, so, you know, he just went up a mountain. That's got to be tiring, right? Right? He's come down the mountain. He's called his disciples. He's gearing up for something, at least in Mark's uh, take on the gospel story. He's gearing up for something, and so he's coming home to rest. But he doesn't get that option. He wants to rest and relax, but the whole crowd gathers in again to the point he can't even eat anything. The people, in a sense, what they are doing is craving more of Jesus. They want to hear what he has to say. They want to be around him. They want to see what he'll do next. And they may not even understand him, but they want or understand who he is, but they want to be there for it. Right? I mentioned Chuck Swindoll earlier in his commentary on the book of Mark. He says, to be fair, Jesus's movement had all the marks of a personality cult. He gathered him around himself, the outcast, the disenfranchised, He challenged the accepted norms of religious and cultural traditions and called himself the ultimate authority. He set up headquarters in Capernaum instead of Jerusalem. People were leaving their occupations to follow him. Some even sold all their possessions. From a distance, Jesus showed all the signs of a manic disorder. Unfortunately, his family was neither close enough to Jesus' intentions nor discerning enough to know better. So we read on in verse 21, when his family heard this, They set out to restrain him because they said he's out of his mind. So his family knows now where he's at, and they're going to leave their homes, likely in Nazareth, and they're going to go towards Capernaum. They want to go find him. Now, this is the first real slice of bread in the sandwich, okay? It's Mark's first mention of Jesus' family. Now, he's not going to give them names. He's not going to talk much more about them here. He'll go on a little bit later in our text, but he's not really even going to get into their identities until chapter 6. Mark doesn't spend a lot of time on Jesus' earthly family. He spends more time on those who follow Jesus, who believe in Jesus, and who surround Jesus. Now, Jesus does, or I'm sorry, Mark does make a point to discuss Jesus' mother. We all know who Jesus' mother is. It's Christmas time, right? Mary, did you know, plays like every other song on the radio. By the way, she did read the Gospel of Luke. Anyway, some denominations or religions, they like to teach that Mary only ever had Jesus and somehow remained a virgin her entire life. That's not true. You read the Gospel of Matthew, there's this one little word inserted in there that lets us know she was married to Joseph and they did what married people do. It says, Joseph woke up, he did as the the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her but did not have sexual relations with her until... She gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. 
the Virgin Mary did not stay a virgin, right? When she had the baby, then Joseph and Mary did what married people do, all right? So we're just going to leave that there. Um, but in spite of all the miracles surrounding Jesus' birth, and we are getting into the Christmas season, like we said next week, we'll get more into Christmas and christmas sermons. But in spite of what she knew, in spite of what Luke's gospel tells us was revealed to her, what the angel Gabriel had said to her, she's concerned. She's worried about him. Has he gone too far? Is he really out of his mind? Maybe she's going because his brothers are really like, we got to get him. We, need to, we just need to tie him up, drag him home. He is the older brother, but you know what? He's, he's gone cuckoo. So we need to get him and we need to bring him home. In fact, the Greek word they use for, for um, when it says we restrain him, it's the Greek word kratase, and it means to arrest him or take him into custody. So they, they plan to, if needed, use force to drag him home. That's what that's telling us. They believe him to be out of his mind. Now, David, in Psalm 69, he foreshadows this a little bit. He says, I've become a stranger to my brothers and a foreigner to my mother's sons because zeal for your house has consumed me and the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Now, this is David likely writing about himself but even as he's writing about himself, it foreshadows the Christ figure. We know this because later, when Jesus in John's Gospels flipping over tables, John 2, 17, the disciples remember the second half of that. It says, zeal for your house will consume me. That's what they remembered the, the scriptures saying. They understand that to be talking about the Messiah. Now, Jesus' family is not on the scene just yet. Like I said, it's the first slice of bread in the sandwich. However, there are this... There's this other group of people who have come down, the scribes. And we've talked quite a bit about the scribes, right? Verse 22, the scribes had come down from Jerusalem, said his, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and he drives out demons by the ruler of demons. Now, there are quite a few things we need to really look at here in what they're saying and why they're saying it. First of all, if you notice, they're giving two separate messages. One, they're saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and the second is that he, is, he drives out demons by the ruler of demons. Now, they're two separate things, but are basically saying the same thing. Why? Because they're going through the crowd, spreading division, spreading problems, right? Creating a chaos, in a sense. And you imagine people in, this, in the crowd, this is how the conversation's going to go. You hear that Jesus casts out demons by the ruler of demons? No, but I heard he does it by Beelzebul, so that's pretty much the same thing, right? Ah, oh, you see, there's, there's tactics to the division they're spreading, to the, to the false lies they're sharing. And we know they, the scribes had come down from Jerusalem. This is an official delegation from the temple who's coming down to listen to him preach and teach and examine his miracles these are the experts, right? These are the proper judges, the lawyers, uh, people who understood all manners of Jewish customs and religion, and they also hold good, great influence over the people. So they're coming down to pass judgment on what he's doing. Now, this would be very similar if the Assemblies of God was going to send their commission for gospel purity. If you are familiar with the Assemblies of God's national constitution and bylaws, they have a commission for gospel purity. Uh, purity. And they, when a church kind of gets a little off the rails, they're supposed to go out and examine what they're teaching. It would be the same thing if they got on a plane and flew up here to Lisbon and came to one of our services and interviewed you guys, interviewed me, and sat through a service. It would be kind of what's happening to Jesus here. Now, the, God, the coalition for, uh, sorry, the commission for doctrinal purity doesn't always do their job. If they do, I have a list of churches I'd like them to look at. But Anyway, do you notice something else about this passage? They don't deny Jesus' power. They acknowledge he is casting out demons, right? They just don't like how he's doing it because they don't know how he's doing it. They affirm Jesus does miracles. Now, what's interesting about this day and age, exorcists, other rabbis, when they would go to cast out a demon, they didn't appeal to Yahweh. They didn't appeal to God. Instead, what they would do more often than not 
is appeal to an angelic power. And in some cases, a higher, stronger demon to come in and replace the smaller one. That's why they say this. This is what they were doing to do these things. They just didn't want to use Satan. They would use different demons. So they're insinuating that Jesus is appealing to the highest demonic authority in order to cast out these demons. Now, Beelzebul, of course, I've talked a little bit about that. Beelzebul, Beelzebub, I won't go into that story because it was kind of funny, but I don't have time. I have two hours to spend. (laughs) Beelzebul was a Philistine deity, but the scribes are using him as a rhetorical device. They're basically trying to insinuate that it's Satan himself. Now, false teachers in this day and age, now, if you want to read up biblically about false teachers, I challenge you to read 2 Peter chapter 2. Literally, it's their playbook, and Peter exposes them. But in this day and age, it was believed that a false prophet was inspired by demons. And even today, we see some people who call themselves prophets, who even though their prophecy may come true, Even though there may be good things that happen in their ministries, they are leading people astray. We see that today. We see it way back then. In fact, God gives us a provision for such people in Deuteronomy 13.5. Even if a person gives a prophetic message, if they are teaching and misleading the people, that prophet or dreamer, as Deuteronomy 13.5, That prophet or dreamer must be put to death because he has urged rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the place of slavery to turn you from the way of the Lord your God has commanded you to walk. You must purge the evil from you. Now this charge alone, which is kind of a scary deal, not to mention if Jesus is actually crazy, this is an embarrassment to his family, right? So they're on their way. Before we move on, we've we've kind of looked at this text from a first century perspective. And I really, I really want us to understand what's happening with these scribes. I want you to be able to wrap your mind around this and try to put this in a modern context as well. We, can, we have the luxury of looking through the lens of history at what's taking place um, in Jesus' present time in the scripture, right? In a sense, Jesus has come to bring the truth. He's come to bring unity to his kingdom, to his church. To Jerusalem and to, to Israel. But what's happening instead? There's the vision. The, stri- the scribes are trying to cast doubt, and they're causing this, even amongst Jesus' disciples, they're causing problems, right? It's another purpose for their being there. While they're accusing Jesus of being a demonic tool, they themselves, who should be supporting Jesus' ministry, have become such a thing. Someone recently asked me, because I do talk quite a bit about false teachers, they asked me, what's the difference between someone who is a false teacher and maybe somebody we don't agree with denominationally? I think it was Lolly asked me that. Sorry not to put you on the spot, but I appreciated that question. The difference is a false teacher cannot biblically support their arguments. They have to twist the scripture, they have to twist the word of God, and they have no orthodoxy and what they're saying. Now, orthodoxy, that's a fun word. Not everybody knows the meaning of it. But orthodoxy is basically uh, a right belief. Um, This is J.I. Packer's definition. He says, as opposed to heresy or heterodoxy, the word orthodoxy expresses the idea that certain statements accurately embody Christianity's revealed truth content and are therefore, in their own nature, normative for the universal church. In other words, there are things we agree on within denominations. But when you go into, we'll say, for example, the Mormon church, who is pushing a different gospel, a different version of Jesus, and a different version of God, we'd say, well, they're not our Christian brothers and sisters. Okay? Now, if they're pushing modalism, for example, that's a different version of God, if you understand what modalism is. Modalism is basically a nice way to say God's schizophrenic, and he's one person with three multiple personalities. You actually hear this, and I'm going to name some names today, so if that bothers you, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry about it. T.D. Jakes, Stephen Furtick, and Elevation Church, they push modalism. That's a different 
God. That's not who we believe. We believe God in three distinct persons. If you want to know more about the Trinity, I did a whole series a couple of years ago called What We Believe. It's apparently worth listening to. I think Calvin listened to it, and he said it was great. So Pastor Calvin endorsed it in my mind, and that works. So, uh, you know, and if they're teaching a different Jesus, that I've talked about kenosis, that Jesus was not acting as God, but was only acting as a man. If someone teaches that, they're teaching a different Jesus. That's what Galatians 1.8 warns us about. If they're teaching a different gospel than what the apostles taught, have nothing to do with them because they're under a curse. We have to be aware of that stuff. And I won't name any more names. We'll move on. But what's interesting and what's ironic about that is they spread the false doctrine, and when someone comes along and points it out, they try to say that person's being divisive. No, they're not. They're being biblical. It, if I'm your shepherd and I'm your watchman and I watch over you, and let's say Dale likes to listen to John Doe who tells him every day he should cut himself, and I come in and say, Dale, you shouldn't listen to this guy. He's telling you to do self-harm. And Dale says, oh, but pastor, he has such good teaching. Well, there's a problem, right? I'm warning you about somebody who's causing you harm and to harm yourself. And you're insisting on listening to that. If Dale got mad and said, well, you're just being divisive, well, no, I'm not. I'm warning you because Paul tells us in Romans 16, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who create divisions and obstacles contrary to the teaching that you learn. If they're teaching in opposition to what is orthodoxy and what we accept and what we believe, then there, there's someone we should avoid because he says avoid them because such people do not serve our Lord Christ but their own appetites. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting with smooth talk and flattering words. I don't deny Stephen Furtick is an incredible public speaker, but I would beware his doctrine. I would beware what he teaches. Those who do these things, they, they are actually the ones teaching a different message. And again, Paul says to the Corinthians, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I urge you that all of you be a that you agree in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be united with the same understanding and same conviction. We all agree in orthodox evangelicalism. We agree Jesus Christ died on a cross for our sins, that, that he was the son of God. He was God operating in a human body, and he rose again on the third day. If somebody wants to come along and preach something different, stay away from them. If they want to preach a Jesus that was born in Jerusalem and not Bethlehem, stay away from them. If they preach that Jesus had to be baptized in the Holy Spirit to do what he did, stay away from them. In fact, the Bible tells me as a pastor, Ephesians 5.11, don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. We should do that. And if you're not sure, come and talk to me hey, this guy has good stuff. What do you know about him? I, I try to keep pretty up to date on these things for this purpose. If I don't know anything about them, we'll, look at, we'll research it together. If you hear a teacher say something, you're kind of questionable, blah, 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 ask Georgette. I'm happy to sit and talk about these things. It's what I do for fun before I was your pastor. I spent 10 years of my life researching the Word of Faith movement because it ruined my life. So when I see these pastors, doing these things and saying these things, and I see how it negatively affects Christians, my heart breaks. But we're going to move on. Because these scribes were doing this to Jesus. They were teaching an opposition to his preaching. Jesus is trying to unify Israel and bring in the freedom that God promises people. And the scribes, if you remember, they don't want that because then they lose control because they've added all these other regulations. Well, We'll touch on that in a minute. But they misunderstood Christ, so they're going to miss everything that matters. Part two, parables and pardons. You see, I gave each one a catchy title. I'm very proud of them. Whatever, they don't matter. Verse 23 says, So he summoned them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? He summoned them. We've seen this word recently, last week actually, when Jesus calls the disciples to himself. Jesus Verse 13 in this chapter, Jesus went up the mountain and summoned those he wanted, and they came to him. It means he called them to himself. 
What's this tell us? What does this confirm? That the scribes have been operating within the crowd. They don't want to go say it to Jesus' face. But that's exactly what he's saying. Why don't you step in here? Why don't you come say that where I can hear you say it? Because I'm going to correct you. And Jesus calls them out as he calls them to himself. And he he begins to speak in parables. Now, some folks don't really know what a parable is. It was actually a very common form of teaching in Judaism. Um, The best way to describe it, it's, it's it's an analogy often used as a story, told in a story form. So he begins, he says, how can Satan drive out Satan? And the parable itself will be when he talks about the strong man, but we'll get into that. Now you remember, in this day and age, exorcists were casting out demons using what? More powerful demons. They would try to cast out the weaker devil. Jesus makes it clear that does not work. You cannot really do that. In fact, he's going to go on. He says, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand but is finished. In other words, if Satan is driving out Satan, what's he doing? He's cutting off his nose to spite his face, right? The scribes, what they're doing, in a sense, they're trying to say that Jesus is under this demonic influence, but very subtly, they're slipping in another little detail. They're comparing Jesus to King Ahaziah. Now, I've talked about him a while back, but Ahaziah is one of the more forgettable kings, which is kind of what their point is that Jesus is going to fizzle out and be forgettable, just like King Ahaziah. But if you've ever read 2 Kings chapter 1, what happens to Ahaziah is he falls out a window and he gets hurt, and because of his injuries, he begins to get sick. And so he calls his aides, he calls his people to him, and he says, go seek Beelzebul, the god of Ekron, and inquire if I'm going to get better. But what happened? The angel of the Lord said to Elijah, the Tishbite, go and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? And if you remember the last time I explained those names, you get to, you might laugh a little. But therefore, this is what the Lord says. You will not get up from your sick bed. You will certainly die. Then Elijah leaves. Ultimately, Ahaziah dies. Why? Because he sought Beelzebub, not God. He's a forgettable king. He fizzles out, right? That's basically the scribes are in a very subtle way trying to hint that that's what's going to happen with Jesus. Why are you guys following him? He's just a flavor of the month. That's really what they're, what they're, what they're trying to insert in there. But Jesus calls him to himself, and he says, it's what you're saying, it doesn't make any sense. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Now, Abraham Lincoln famously quotes this portion of scripture Uh, back in the 1860s when the United States was involved in a civil war and we were tearing ourselves apart. He's, you know, a kingdom is a nation. And if a nation is at war with itself, they're devouring one another, they're killing one another, brother against brother. You ever read the book Across Five Aprils? Great story. And it literally talks about brothers fighting one another on the battlefield. And that's what was happening. If Satan does that to himself, he's going to ruin his kingdom, right? Now, Satan's evil. Satan's twisted. Don't get that wrong. But he's not stupid. He's been around for thousands of years. He's not going to do that to himself. You think the devil just walks around with a pistol and literally shoots himself in the foot? No. But that's what Jesus says they're insinuating. He says, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. A house is property, it's it's people, it's a family's reputation, it's a legacy. Now, if you've ever, I don't know, how many of you have ever read Edgar Allan Poe? You were forced to do that in school? Yeah? Okay, four or five, that's better than the last time. I had everybody raise hand. Edgar Allan Poe's dark, I'm not endorsing this, but he does have this story that is a beautiful illustration of just this fact. It's called The Fall of the House of Usher. The narrator goes to, to visit his friend Roderick, And he pulls up at this house that looks like it's about ready to fall into the swamp. But he goes inside, and inside the house, there's beautiful tapestries and paintings and classy furniture. If you were on the inside of the house, you wouldn't know that on the outside, it looks like it's falling apart. 
In fact, the picture we're using looks very similar to how I would imagine the house of Usher to look. But something else is going on within that house. Roderick has a sister named Madeline. And slowly and quietly over the years, Roderick's been poisoning her. And while the narrator's there, it's assumed she died. So they put her in another room. And you know, that didn't really sit well with Madeline. When someone tries to kill me, I get pretty upset too. So she gets out, she breaks out, and she and Roderick begin to fight. And the narrator says, all right, I'm out. And so he leaves and turns around just in time to watch the whole house collapse into the swamp upon the two. That is a beautiful picture, really, of a house divided. It looks good. We think we're doing all right because the paintings on the wall look nice, but we're fighting each other. There's division. We're poisoning one another. And pretty soon the house falls into a swamp. Satan's house, Satan's kingdom is one of darkness, sickness, demonic possession, ultimately death. But his possessions are people that he has enslaved and held hostage in that house. And Jesus says something next that has been kind of twisted. This is the parable. This is something that's kind of been twisted and contorted into some sort of demonic horror story. So just pay attention, okay? He says, but no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions until he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. That's really the parable there, okay? The strong man is not a demon of high rank. He's not an arch devil or anything like that. I, I know Frank Peretti likes to use that as a literary tool. I like Frank Peretti. He's fun, but he's fiction, okay? We don't get our theology from Frank Peretti. Some people have, and they like to say that the strong man is a high-ranking demon. He's not. Jesus is saying it's the devil himself who is the strong man. But there needs to be someone stronger, someone greater, who has the ability to bind the strong man. Well, who has the power to bind Satan? God, right? What's Jesus been doing? Binding Satan. What's he saying? I am God. That's what he's trying to get across. Remember, I, I like to quote John Piper says, that Satan always has a bit in his mouth and God holds the reins. You look at the story of Job. Job's a guy, he's pretty well off. He's doing okay. God holds counsel in the courts of heaven and Satan shows up and he says, hey, uh, look at your, or God says, look at my guy Job. He's doing pretty good. And this is what Satan says in chapter one, verse nine through 12. He says, does Job fear God for nothing? Haven't you placed a hedge around him, his household and everything he owns? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased the land and, and have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he owns, and he will surely curse you to your face. Very well, the Lord told Satan there. He gave him permission. Everything he owns is in your power. However, do not lay a hand on Job himself. So Satan leaves the Lord's presence. And what happens? All of his servants, pretty much all of his servants die. His kids die. He loses his property. He loses his land. Satan destroys everything Job has. But Job doesn't sin. So Satan goes back to God, and he says, you know, I've been walking around the earth. There's nobody really good. God says, ah, but did you see Job? He made it through your first test. And Satan says, well, skin for skin. And what's he do? He ends up getting God to give him permission to affect and infect Job's skin. And so he does it again. And Job is never told why this suffering happened. Job is never told why he had to go through that turmoil. But we know this. God uses it and allows Satan to do these things for his glory, right? Someone I read recently said, God uses suffering not only to increase your attention to him, but also to increase your affection for him. Again, to quote C.S. Lewis, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Now, in the terms of spiritual warfare, we serve the only one with the authority to bind the strong man, Right? We follow Christ. He's the one who destroys the strongholds of Satan. He's the one who binds the strong man and releases the hostages and sets them free. And if we miss that, we miss everything. But we read on. Jesus says in verse 28 through 30, Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for all sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. 
But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Now, in most translations, if you're reading and you're still looking at your Bible, there's usually a paragraph break right there. And that's, that's on purpose. Because what that indicates is the scribes had a chance to say something, but they're on mute. They've had their mouths shut by what Jesus has said. They understand, okay, what we were saying sounds pretty dumb whenever we think about it like that, right? So Jesus begins this statement with the words, truly I tell you, and this is the first time Mark has Jesus say this this way. Why is that important? Because most rabbis of that day and age, when they would begin a lecture, when they would begin to teach, when they would begin to preach from Scripture, after they were done, they would say, truly everything I've told you is true. But if you're looking at your King James, Jesus begins, verily, verily, I say unto thee, right? Truly, I tell you. Why does Jesus do it different? Because Jesus is not going to try and slip something in. Jesus knows out of his mouth, his word is truth, and everything he's going to say from this point forward is true. Jesus is not going to deceive them. Jesus is not going to say something and then flip-flop the next day. That's not how he operates. Instead, basically what he's saying is, everything I'm about to tell you from this point forward isn't a parable. It's a very true statement. This is a fact, something you can take to the bank. The psalmist speaks to this. It says, the entirety of your word is truth. Each of your righteous judgments endure forever. He's speaking about Jesus, whose word is truth. And in this truth, in his speech, Jesus offers and, and gives us a very shocking warning. He tells us, whatever sin you commit will be forgiven. Every single one, except one. Except the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. He says, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Now, I said I've grown up in the Assemblies of God. I went to Bible college. I can guarantee you the one conversation that I've had with young Christians, baby Christians, full-grown adults throughout my life, the one conversation that I've had more than any other is, what if I've committed the unforgivable sin? People are really scared that they have done this. And the reason they're afraid of that is because when they come across in Scripture, there's very rarely clear teaching on it, and sometimes a lot of pastors don't know how to respond. In fact, I was told at a young age that if you make fun of somebody for speaking in tongues, that's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Well, I'd messed up by the fourth grade, right? I, we had this lady in our church. She was awesome. She was my Sunday school teacher. Her name was Myra. Beautiful lady, just spirit-filled, amazing, and I'm not going to say what she said in her speaking in tongues, but every week it was the same message in tongues, and it sounded like I see a chicken. It's not what she said, but when I was a kid, we had chickens. And I remember one time I was with my dad, and I said, I see a chicken, chicken I see. Quap, on the back of my head. Don't do that. I know what you're doing. <laughs> you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. No, I'm an ignorant kid. Okay? Everyone has sin, by the way. Every single person has sin. 1 John 1, 8 through 9 says, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all forms of unrighteousness. Yet every sin will be forgiven except one. We have to ask, what exactly is this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Blasphemy, the, the Greek word is very hard. It's actually blasphemy. It's actually blasphemy. See is the tense used here. But you should be able to remember that, right? That goes in the diary. Dear diary, I learned Greek today. Blasphemy. No, it means defiant, irreverent. To acknowledge that this is a sin, then it can be forgiven. To confess this sin, it can be forgiven. The sin becomes unpardonable when the guilty person rejects the offered forgiveness. When they reject the path that leads to pardon and they continue in their rebellion 
and they refuse to ask God for forgiveness. In other words, to ask God for forgiveness absolves you of all sin. But to not do that is the one sin he can't forgive. And one author said, whenever someone deliberately and disrespectfully slanders the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit in pointing to the lordship and redemption of Jesus Christ, he completely negates and forfeits any possibility of present or future forgiveness of sins because he has wholly rejected the only basis of God's salvation. Again, to simplify that, the unpardonable sin is to reject Christ entirely. That's it. And someone who commits that isn't worried that they've committed it. They have a repentant heart. And so if you're worried, did I commit the unpardonable sin? Chances are no. If you've given your life to Christ, there's no way you have. If you confess your sins to him, you have not committed that. And the scribes are condemning themselves here. That's really what Jesus is saying. Because there, even after he said this stuff and debated them, and he's taught with them, and he's condemned them at times, they remain unrepentant, even to the point they're saying what God is doing is satanic. That's the unpardonable sin. I won't have anything to do with that, right? That's not from God. They willingly and selfishly choose to misunderstand Christ, and because of that, they'll miss everything. Part three, the mothers and the brothers. This is the last slice of bread in the story sandwich. His mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. Now they've arrived on the scene. Now we're not told how much time has passed from the beginning of this portion of, te- of the text and the end. I would assume it's at least a day or two. They've packed up the donkeys. They've, they've made the trip, and now they are there, and they're ready to get Jesus. It's interesting that we call this a story sandwich to me. I thought this was kind of funny. We call it a storage sandwich. But at the very beginning of the text, Jesus couldn't even eat because of the crowd. And I thought, isn't it just like Jesus? He can't eat, but he still gives us a sandwich. Okay. (laughs) His family shows up. And because of the crowd, they're not able to go and talk to him. They're not. I told you, I'm the same here as I am at home. So if you didn't like that joke, you would hate hanging out with me outside of church. Anyway. His family arrives, and they want to take him home. And you remember why they're there. They think he's lost his senses. But they don't get to interact with him, not with him, not directly. They have to send word inside the house. Now, one thing we should notice really quick, who's absent? Father. Where's Joseph? Well, it's likely Joseph has passed away. In fact, church tradition tells us Joseph had passed away at this point. But Mark doesn't name these relatives that are there. He doesn't even name Mary. He might be left to wonder why. The crowd, of course, they they let Jesus know that they're there. A crowd was sitting around him and told him, look, your mother, your brothers, your sisters are outside asking for you. He replied to them, who are my mother and my brothers? Looking at those in a circle around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. When you read that as a parent, it stings, doesn't it? Is he really disowning me? You know, if I were Mary in this situation, my heart drops. What is he really saying here? Well, some take this to mean that Jesus is trying to destroy the family structure. Believe me, that is not what he's doing. He invented the family structure when he gave Eve to Adam. So that's not what he's doing here. He's saying, who are my mother and my brothers? His audience is a first century Near Eastern, near Eastern people, they're going to understand this to be a rhetorical question. He's not expecting, he knows who they are. The family bond is sacred in this era and in this time and in this place. You don't, you don't put down your mother. You honor your father and mother, right? And Jesus is, he, he is without sin, so we know he honored his father and mother. But Jesus looks around this circle of people around him, and who does he really see? He sees people who've left their jobs, people who've left their families, people who've given up everything to come and follow him. He looks at the disciples who left their boats. 
Matthew who left his tax booth. He sees Thaddeus who left his mama. If you remember last week, maybe it's funny to you. But they left everything to become a part of his kingdom. They're now living in the new birth that he talks about in John 3, 3. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The disciples are living this. They have given up their old lives to follow Christ and pursue this new life that he's promised them. And in Acts chapter 2, they're going to receive the, power, the Holy Spirit's baptism. And they're going to receive this common hunger for righteousness and the desire to see God's will above all else performed and taken, taken place in the world. I quoted this verse last week, but they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. This is the, the life of people who've been with Jesus. And he looks at them and he says, this is my true family. These are my brothers and sisters. But then he puts a very specific qualification on it. He says, whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Whoever does the will of God. There has to be visible obedience. True trust in God, true fellowship with Christ, true leading of the Holy Spirit is observable. It is visible, it is deliberate, it is distinctive, and the world around you can see it. We may claim to be in Christ, but it's only by doing the will of Christ that people may see that it's true. It's not just enough to believe. The belief has to change you. The belief has to manifest in works and in fruit. That's what James tells us. In James 2, he says, you see a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. A little earlier than that, he said, some will say you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. The works don't save you. The works are evidence of you having been saved. Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit. We all know, if you went to Sunday school, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the fruit of the Spirit that are manifest. These are the works of the Spirit in your life. If nobody can see these things, if it's not observable, then John 15 tells us you've severed your connection to Christ. Because those who are with... Those who are connected to the vine bear much fruit, right? If nobody sees that, there's no fruit to be had. You're not a member of his family. To miss this is to miss Christ. And from there, you will miss everything that eternally matters. Now, I'm not really going to go for two hours today. I was going to try it. But, but I'm going to move to close in just a moment. Maybe you're here and maybe you're the sole believer in your home. Maybe you're the only Christian at your job and you feel alone. You feel like there's a lot of unmerited, unwanted, unwanted, unneeded conflict that comes from such things. You know, Jesus knows how you feel. The people around him, the scribes, thought he was demon-possessed. His family thought he was crazy. And the hard truth is those who choose to love the world over a love for Christ will probably never understand you. They will never understand the church. They'll never understand the gospel because they've made their, their choosing the world. That's what Jesus is saying when he prays. When I pointed this out last week. When he prays for us, he said, I've given them your word. The world hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world, I am not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so that they also may be sanctified by the truth. The fact is, we need him. We need him to have his strength to face this life, his patience to deal with those we don't see eye to eye with, those we need, we need his wisdom as we operate throughout this world. We need the, all of that to show honor to ungodly parents, ungodly bosses, ungodly coworkers. Maybe you're here and you're saying, you know what? I've really wrestled with have I committed the unforgivable sin. If you're still concerned about that, take time to pray about it. I promise you, you haven't. Maybe, you know, maybe you're someone that likes to spread the division, things like that. Maybe you like gossip. 
I'm going to be honest, I, I, I like gossip. Who doesn't, right? Give me something juicy. That's why we watch the news anymore, because that's basically all it is, right? Today's a day of repentance. Today's a day to confess our sins and be healed. James says, confess your sins one to another and be, so that you can be healed. I'm not saying you have to stand up and do that. Please don't do that. Just pray. Ask someone to pray with you. I'm not going to tell you you have to come forward. You can pray where you're at. But just before you leave, spend a few moments in prayer. And if you will, stand with me today as we close. Father God, I just thank you for this message. I thank you for, I know it's a lengthier message. I pray, Lord, that your word is still penetrating our hearts. That you've given us plenty to think about, pray about, meditate on. But ultimately, Lord, that you be glorified through it all that it be your message, your word. Father, that you're glorified and that we are drawn closer to you. That we're edified, that we're challenged, that we're convicted. Father, most of all, make us like your son. Holy Spirit, lead us, guide us, go with us as we leave today. For those who are traveling over the next week, I pray you keep them safe on the road from other drivers, from deer. Father, I just pray that you come back next Sunday excited to get into your word and the Christmas story. God, I thank you. I pray you're glorified as we leave today in our speech, in our actions, in our thoughts. That we not walk out the doors alone, but we go with your Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.